Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, this hearing of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. Uh, I am uh, Councilman Barry Grudenchik. I have the honor of chairing this committee for this term of the City Council. We are joined today uh, by Councilman Steve Matteo of Staten Island, my colleague in, from Queens, Peter Koo. Um, we're going to be hearing several bills today. Um, I'm going to read an opening statement and then we're going to turn it over to Mr. Matteo for his uh, opening statement, and hopefully by that time or that we'll have one more opening statement. Um, but right now, let me uh, read mine. Um, we're going to be hearing uh, intro 161 this morning in relation to reporting on parks capital expenditures, and intros uh, 1009 in relation to requiring AED devices at uh, and trained personnel at all city pool facilities, and intro 1042. Uh, in relation to distributing excess uh, AEDs from youth baseball and softball to other sports. Uh, we will consider, as I said, three bills this morning. Um, I will let the sponsors address uh, those bills in detail, hopefully briefly. Uh, intro 161 is prime sponsors, Councilor Mark Levine, focuses on uh, improving transparency as it relates to the Parks Department's capital budget process. Uh, it seeks to improve the online capital tracker by requiring that more up-to-date information be included on the web portal, including the location of the project specified by Borough Council District and Community District, the date when a project uh, was fully funded along with any adjustments to original cost estimates, the date a project was assigned by a Department of Parks and Recreation staffer, an accounting and dis description of any delays to any phase of a project, a description of any cost overrun, an up-to-date listing of the total number of projects currently assigned to DPR, and the total number of projects completed during the most recent fiscal year and the average amount of time taken to complete such projects. Uh, it's no surprise to anyone here today that this information relating to the status of capital projects is sometimes hard to come by. So this bill has the potential to increase transparency and knowledge about how funded capital projects are proceeding. Intro uh, 1009, sponsored by uh, Councilmember Matteo, would require the Parks Department to provide an AED at every pool facility under its jurisdiction and to have at least one employee trained to use the AED present during all hours of pool supervision. Uh, the last bill that we'll hear today is 1042, also sponsored by Councilmember Matteo would uh, permit the Department of Citywide Administrative Services and the Department of Parks and Recreation to distribute any extra AEDs they have after they fulfill their obligation to provide AEDs to youth baseball and softball leagues. The Council has had a long-standing view that AEDs play a crucial role in saving lives and that we as a city need to ensure that they are readily available at various public places where it is reasonable to make them accessible. We have passed multiple bills in recent years that require the placement of AEDs in various public buildings and facilities, require youth baseball leagues that play on DPR property to make available at least one AED in every game and practice, and require the city to provide defibrillators to all youth softball leagues playing on city-owned land, and the league in turn would be required to bring an AED to every game and practice. The bills we're hearing today have the possibility uh, to ensure that more lives are saved at park facilities, and I'm eager to engage in a discussion about the best way uh, forward. I welcome uh, the administration and the advocates who have come today to testify. Uh, and at this time, we will hear from Council Member Matteo. I also want to welcome uh, another colleague from Queens, member of the committee, Councilman Jimmy Van Bramer. Thank you, Chair Grudenchik. I'm going to just quickly summarize, since you did a good job of pointing out the bills. Obviously, um, when I took office, um, I wanted to build and access my predecessor in the council, now Bar President Jimmy Otto when he passed uh, um, a local law in 2005, Local Law 20, um, and we've been successful in expanding AEDs with, with Parks' uh, cooperation and assistance, and this is what we want to do here. Uh, we have two successful bills in, in expanding it to baseball and softball. We're looking to give you discretion to be able to expand it further, and the other bill, as Council Member uh, Chair Gredentrick talked about, would provide AEDs at um, at our pool facilities near the life near the lifeguard stand. So I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss and go through the issues with you, and uh, I thank you, Chair, for your support and for holding this hearing, and I'll send it back to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Matteo. We've also been joined by uh, Councilman Joe Borelli, also a member of this committee. Joseph? Now I have to call him James instead of Jimmy. What's going on? You never get called James, right? Uh, I've, I've read about that recently. Um, Councilman Borelli, who I visited recently with at the conference house, he schlepped me around the floor. It was great stuff. Great stuff. And he disproved the myth of deer on Staten Island. It is, in fact, true. I did see my first deer on Staten Island. Uh, this time, um, we welcome uh, from New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, uh, Matt Drury and Diane Jacquier. I get that right? All right. Close enough for government work. Okay. Uh, we welcome your testimony at this time. Oh, first, you got to be sworn mm -hmm. in, not sworn at. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I do. I do. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Grudenchek, members of the Parks Committee, and other members of the City Council. My name is Matt Drury, Director of Government Relations at NYC Parks, and I'm joined today by Diane Jackier, our agency's Chief of Capital Strategic Initiatives. Thank you for inviting us today to discuss three bills. Introduction 161, uh, regarding uh, NYC Parks' online capital project tracker, along with Introduction uh, 1009 and Introduction 1042, which concern the use and distribution of automated external defibrillators, also known as AEDs. I'll adjust these bills in numerical order, uh, beginning with Introduction 161. The Capital Division at NYC Parks is primarily responsible for the management of over 630 active park improvement projects currently underway throughout the city, ranging in scale from targeted asphalt and pathway paving to the complete reimagining and reconstruction of entire park properties. As we have testified before this committee in recent years, this administration has made great strides in demonstrating our commitment to delivering projects on time and on budget in a manner that can incorporates a tremendous degree of transparency and public engagement. The spirit of openness is best embodied by the development of the NYC Parks Capital Project Tracker launched in the fall of 2014. The tracker, an online searchable tool which can be accessed publicly via the NYC Parks website, okay. is one of the most robust project trackers of its kind that has been publicly made available by a city agency. The Capital Project Tracker is updated daily and allows anyone, be it an elected official, supporter of a specific park, or just your average curious New Yorker, to look up a specific park and learn more about any Capital Project status, including helpful project information compiled and posted by our Capital staff. I'm proud to update the Council that to date, the tracker has visited, uh, excuse me, has received over 618,000 website visits, and last year, the tracker saw an average of 556 page views per day, giving citizens the information they need and deserve about park improvements for their community updated in real time. The information on the tracker for each project includes a description of the project and its location, the actual or estimated timelines for each project phase, a description of the project's budget, including the sources of funding, and even often includes conceptual design documents to give the public a glimpse of the improvements being made so they know what to expect when the project is complete. This information, made available to the public at any time, is above and beyond the regular project updates routinely provided to council members, community boards, and other constituencies and advocates for specific projects. The existence of the Capital Project Tracker is codified via Local Law 98 of 2015, and Introduction 161, as drafted, would amend the administrative code to compel that the tracker display several additional data points for each individual project. We appreciate the intent behind this legislation as we believe the tracker in its current form clearly demonstrates an unprecedented commitment to public transparency. However, we feel strongly that the agency's primary responsibility regarding our park improvement projects is to deliver them faster and within budget. Every moment that our capital staff spends on satisfying additional reporting requirements or managing other administrative burdens is a moment we're not focusing on getting these projects done on time and on budget. As Commissioner Silver and other senior staff has testified before this committee, that's the top priority for our capital division, and we've heard loud and clear that council members feel the same. As you're aware, there's been significant positive change in regards to our agency's capital project delivery. In Commissioner Silver's time as leader of the agency, NYC Parks has been able to shave several months off the capital process, namely uh, during design while minimizing construction delays. We've streamlined internal design reviews, we've worked closely with the Public Design Commission to develop new approaches for project review, and we've instituted regularly scheduled coordination meetings to note potential projects that might be problematic and do our best to, emerge, uh, to address emerging con uh, concerns swiftly. Regarding the construction phase for projects, we've altered our approach to change orders, which are last-minute alterations that can add months to a project's timeline. 
We've reduced those change orders by nearly 80% as we now insist that a construction change order be directly related to life safety or other emergency needs if it is to be approved. The agency is always looking for more ways to improve on its work. We'll continue these efforts, but if we're to be successful, it's important that the council uh, join us in partnership and support this endeavor. Help us avoid the inadvertent distraction and misallocation of resources made necessary by additional administrative and reporting requirements. Further, there are specific elements of the current legislation that would prove technically challenging to fulfill and in some cases potentially problematic from a legal perspective. NYC Parks fully embraces the spirit of transparency that this bill seeks to achieve and we welcome further discussion on the citywide capital process, including the similarly themed legislation such as Introduction 113, which would compel the creation of a website to track all city capital projects for which a council hearing, I believe, has been scheduled for later this month. We'll be happy to continue to work with the council and discuss, uh, discuss improvements to the capital process writ large, as well as targeted ways in which we can augment our public communication efforts without negatively impacting the project management workflow that we've strived to improve in recent years to great positive effect. I'd like to now shift focus to discuss the legislation concerning automated external defibrillators, or AEDs, and provide a little context about the agency's use of these devices. Uh, at NYC Parks, the safety of our park patrons is always first and foremost on our minds, and we want to ensure that trained individuals can have the necessary equipment to intervene in emergency situations, which can help save lives. In accordance with New York City Local Law 20 of 2005, NYC Parks currently has a total of 85 AEDs located in 69 facilities across our park system, as well as 36 of our golf course and athletic facility concessions. We also retain additional AEDs at select seasonal locations, including approximately 25 units at lifeguard stations along our recreational beaches. Generally speaking, the units are stored in mounted cabinets located in buildings that are supervised by staff. At each location, we have staff that are trained in the use of AEDs present at the facility at all times during operating hours. Parks has over 850 employees that are currently trained as AED responders, including our parks enforcement patrol officers, recreation center staff, and administrative staff. To maintain their training credentials, they are required to attend training every two years at the Parks Academy, which is the training arm of our Budget and Human Resources Division. Introduction 1009 would add pool facilities under the jurisdiction of NYC Parks to the definition of publicly accessible areas where AEDs must be present and appropriately trained personnel must be available. I'm pleased to report that the availability of AEDs and trained personnel is already standard operating procedure at our 34 Olympic and intermediate outdoor pools. Adding this requirement would compel the agency to expand AED installation and staff training for an additional 19 outdoor mini pools and 12 indoor pools. We're supportive of the intent uh, of this legislation, uh, though of course we will uh, need to work with the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget through the normal budget process to assess <coughs> specific cost implications. Uh, moving on to the last bill, uh, NYC Parks works closely with our youth baseball and youth softball leagues that play and practice on ball fields under our jurisdiction as we distribute AED units and provide training courses for adults involved in the leagues pursuant to Local Law 57 of 2016 and Local Law 119 of 2018. Building and executing this program has required a very substantial administrative and organizational effort on part of the agency in coordination with various stakeholders. Uh, and I'm pleased to note that it's been a success. Uh, since the local law took effect in spring 2017, we've engaged over 250 youth baseball leagues and 100 youth softball leagues, uh, distributed over 1,800 AED units, and facilitated training for over 4,000 adults. We've also engaged in a thorough educational effort to ensure that the youth leagues are aware of their responsibility to keep the AED units on hand during games and practices with appropriately trained adult supervision on hand at all times. We're pleased to report that we're not aware of any instances in which an AED unit needed to be deployed by the youth leagues in an emergency medical situation, knock, knock on wood. As currently drafted, uh, Introduction 1042 would amend current law to grant the agency the authority to distribute unused AED units to youth leagues for sports other than softball and baseball. Uh, given current agency budgeting and purchasing practices, our current portfolio of AED units reflects the, the need to ensure consistent compliance with existing law. And given that, it's, it's difficult to envision a practical scenario in which the agency uh, would have uh, a substantial number of AED units available for a redistribution scheme to additional youth, uh, youth leagues. Uh, also, as, as the uh, proposed legislation is currently drafted, it doesn't seem to compel those said youth leagues uh, to have the devices on hand, uh, nor to have uh, properly trained adults present. So that could lead to some confusion, uh, you know, potentially some difficult circumstances. Regardless, we, we definitely appreciate the spirit of the legislation and uh, the creativity of the approach, and we're very much open to further discussion uh, with the sponsor and other council members to, to discuss access to safety equipment. 
Uh, to conclude, we appreciate the council's interest and advocacy regarding these topics. We look forward to continuing to work with you and your colleagues to make New York City parks and playgrounds better than ever. Uh, New York City Parks is committed to our shared goals of transparency and public safety, and we're always happy to participate in dialogue about how, how to best be able to achieve those goals. So thanks for having us here today to testify, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Drury. Uh, we've been joined by uh, the sponsor of the Capital Tracker Bill, Councilman Mark Levine of Manhattan. At this time, I think he would like to uh, issue an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to see the administration. I've actually lost track of how many hearings we've talked about the capital process. Uh, we don't need to relitigate uh, the tremendous frustration that, that our constituents feel with the time it takes to do even modest capital renovations. I know you know that. I know you've heard that. Um, I, I do look forward to asking you um, in more detail about your progress in solving that problem. But there's just no question that sunlight is the best disinfectant, that giving our constituents the most transparent view of where capital projects they care about are is extremely helpful. <clears throat> it's a little like subway platforms, where um, if there's a delay, it's hard to make it good, but at least knowing exactly where the train is and how long it's going to be does help people grapple with um, problems of service in the subway. And I think it's the same for delays in capital projects. I also do think it um, forces the conversation with the administration so that we as policymakers and advocates can start to look across capital projects and really track our progress towards um, reducing these delays. Um, we have talked repeatedly um, about my disagreement with the way you measure on time status, which traditionally is focused on the construction stage, which is really one of four stages. I think you would probably call it one of, of three stages, but in my mind there's, there's pre-design, design, procurement, and construction. And um, uh, in previous hearings you've talked about an 88% on time rate. Um, which does sound impressive until one realizes that doesn't, that doesn't count delays in the procurement design or pre-design stage. Um, I, 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 I do want to acknowledge what an important step forward the Parks Capital Tracker has been. I think it's the best of any agency doing capital work, and it's been a great help um, to people in my district who want to track uh, the status of projects they care about. It doesn't cover everything that, that I think it should cover, and so uh, this bill, intro 161, uh, addresses other pieces of information which I think would make it uh, an even stronger tool, um, such as the date at which projects are fully funded, uh, the names of the council members and elected officials who funded the project, uh, names of the contractors, uh, reasons for delays, uh, and other uh, specific, specific information identified in the bill. Um, I don't know, Mr. Chairman, whether you're moving right into Q&A. I think that's it for me on the opening statement front. I'll pass it back to you, and when appropriate, I have some questions as well. Stay ready. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just want to emphasize, you know, uh, we love our parks, and I think, as Councilman Levine said, uh, people look at that tracker more than anything else. Um, they are, of course, concerned about many different issues. I was at uh, Councilman Van Bramer, chair of uh, the Cultural Affairs Committee, I'd be happy to know. I was at a CASA celebration last night. Uh, when I mentioned progress on Redwood Playground, in, which is right next door to the school that uh, I was at, uh, PSIS 178, um, that got the loudest applause. So uh, we love our parks, and um, I think we miss them when they're under reconstruction. Um, just a couple of questions, and then I'm going to um, first turn it over to uh, Councilman Matteo and then back to Councilman Levine. Um, can you tell me, um, in your first, uh, first page of testimony, um, Parks, you stated you're concerned about, um, you know, this might divert resources from uh, other work that you do. Do you, do you have any figure what it might cost Parks to comply with the uh, the bill as drafted on capital tracking? 
I think it's hard to codify an actual amount of time uh, specifically because it you know will depend project to project. But there are some you know highly technical and specific data points that this new bill seeks to add. Uh, so in a broader sense, I think it's more about the fact that we believe the, pr the tracker in its current incarnation represents a really uh, Im uh, balance between getting the information out there that we know New Yorkers need and deserve while keeping the, the disruption and, and, and impact a administratively you know, to, to a minimal degree. So I, I don't think I have a, an exact number that I could quote you in terms of uh, person hours, is, uh, except that it would, it would be considerable. Is the current way that you, that, that you track projects now and report them to uh, the public, um, is that the job of one person, five people? Is it is it, is everybody at Capital kind of involved? Do they have, all have access to updating the system? If you could explain, yeah. you take us through that a little, I would appreciate that. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to defer to Diane here, except to say that it is certainly a team effort uh, in, that's uh, in terms of data entry uh, into our project management software, Unifier, that's then you know transferred automatically to to the to the, uh, to the tracker. But I'll let Diane expound on that a little bit. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, almost all staff in the Capital Division have access to our project management system, <coughs> excuse me, and each one of them plays a specific role, enters dates, milestone information related to the specific projects that they're working on. So there really is almost no one in the building who doesn't have a touch point into the system. This is at the Olmstead Center? Correct. Okay. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Um, but, but if I may just, sorry, really yes. quickly, but it's also the staff that are most closely involved with that particular, you know, technical aspect. So it makes sense, you know, that they'd be entering that data just, you know, to, just to clarify that, you know, the people who are most, you know, familiar with the progress on that aspect of the project, you know, and are, are, are chiefly tasked with that. You know, as, as a member of the council, I like to visit ongoing projects, and I'm sure my colleagues all visit theirs uh, from time to time when we have the time. Do you rely upon the contractor at all for some of this information? I assume that you know you're not out that you're not out at each project every day. I, well, I, well, Parks has a series of resident engineers that are agency staff, and they are the chief liaison with the construction contractor that's on site. And in many cases, they actually are on on site every day or close to it. So okay. um, there is very much a, a cl uh, you know close uh, coordination between our, our resident engineers, our agency staff, and and the contractor on site. Um. The mayor's management report uh, only reports statistics for the construction phase of the pro process, and I know that you're not responsible for that report, but do we have any idea why it doesn't report on the timeliness of the other phases of the process? Uh, no, I think that's a question I'd have to defer to the mayor's office of operations on in terms of how or why you know the report is conceived the way it is. Um, I mean, I guess I'll go a little further to say, you know, I believe in terms of the general public, uh, to the degree that construction is disruptive to a site, you know, I think that's a very public-facing, you know, sort of aspect. So I think there's value uh, specifically uh, re related to construction that I think people are keenly aware of. So it's not that the other phases aren't also important, but I think there's a degree to which I, I think the common New Yorker interacts with parks improvement projects, you know, most directly during the construction phase. Okay. Um, all right. I, I'm going to uh, pause in my questions now, and I'm going to uh, turn it over to Councilman Matteo for uh, questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I want to first thank you for working with us to pass um, Local Law 57 and 119. Um, obviously, we had to come up with a creative solution to make this work, and uh, we here at the Council appreciate your partnership to making that work. So before I just get into a few, uh, some questions on the current, I just want to just backtrack real quick on 57 and 119 on the baseball and softball bills. Just just generally speaking, how, how is the process going? Has there been any issues? And just comments on just how that process has been going. Sure. Uh, I think we characterized it overall. It's, it's uh, the you know operational elements of the distribution and educating the teams providing the training has all gone very, very well. Uh, the most important thing that we're happy to note is that, you know, there haven't, thankfully, uh, been any uh, uh, negative incidents in which the d units have needed to be deployed, which is, uh, which is really wonderful. Uh, but still, you know, I think uh, many of the leagues are uh, appreciative and, uh, and the actual operation, it's, I, I do have to give credit to our, to our staff. It's a, it's a really uh, considerable undertaking. So it's, it's, you know, it's no small feat 
Uh, so we want to give them proper credit. It takes the coordination of, you know, uh, many employees and, and all the various leagues and a lot of pieces that have to come together. But uh, we feel so far compliance has gone very, very well. Good. And so for the ba- any of the baseball soap leagues, has there there's been an issue where any of the leagues have not complied? And where you had to issue a penalty, or uh, we haven't or had to issue any follow up, or yeah. Uh, so our, our policy and our approach, generally speaking, for for all this is true of all park rules. Generally, uh, we have been doing our, our parks enforcement patrol and other operational staff uh, have been doing spot checks during the seasons, and uh, I think there have been a handful of warnings assigned at sort of usually at the beginning, near the end, uh, beginning of the season, just to remind everyone, uh, you know, perhaps the device is you know, in the coach's car or something like that, and then go get it, like that okay. sort of, so that's, it's largely, compliance has generally been very, very uh, positive. Okay, and um, offhand, do you, do you know the cost of each AD that you're, that we're yeah, it, in the program? Yeah, it ranges depending on the model, but it varies be- somewhere between 1,600 to 2,000. Just for the model, or is that for the training too? Oh, sorry, no, training is, uh, per person, it's a little difficult to, to one second. Uh, provided a full class, which is 30 or so people, right? 20, sorry. 20 or so people, it works out to about uh, uh, $50 a person, give or take. A person? Yeah. Okay. He said you made it. Um, how many have you um, handed out and how many have you purchased? Uh, I know we have distributed to the leagues roughly 1,800, 1,800 at okay. this point. Uh, I don't know how many have been purchased in total but i you know I, I i believe it's generally in the ballpark of that that amount okay um so just jumping to the first bill the lifeguard bill 1009 um so the in your testimony you said you have them at 34 pools yeah our and outdoor 19 and 12 Mini pools and 12 indoor pools would have to be covered. Correct. So that's the, the 65, that's the total that you got parks has covered in the entire city with pools? Sorry, 65, sorry. You have 34, right, that you already have them Oh, in. right, sorry. Plus so the total universe of pools would yeah. be, yeah, roughly 65. 65. That's correct. 65, okay. Yep. So where in the 34 pools, where are the ADs stored? Where are they brought if they're inside, are they brought outside during pool hours? Right. Are they always next to a lifeguard? Just where, where are they're, they? They're generally in cabinets located in or near, like, the lifeguard changing rooms, which are, which are directly adjacent to the pool deck. So it's easy access when they're there? Very much so. So during um, – when the pool's closed – because we had this whole talk about theft and everything. You, you, they're away, they're Correct. They, away. Correct. Off-season, so when outside of pool season, uh, for the outdoor pools, they get transferred uh, to our storehouse. Uh, I think our five-borough store, storehouse on Randall's. What about even after the hours of operation? Are they still in the same spot? Those, I think during the season, I'll have to double-check this, but I believe I believe those facilities are lockable. You know, so overnight, I believe they remain on. I believe they remain on site, but I can double check that for you. And the the you're paying for this obviously different than you've used our, our program for baseball softball because this was existing. Correct. I mean, you know, I guess from the agency's perspective, we purchase. You know, I, I presume we you know we purchase in bulk, and then we have contracts and that sort of thing. So it may be drawn off a similar purchase order, but but we do view it in a you know the com, you know in terms of compliance viewed in two different ways. And if we were to. Okay. Mm-hmm. If we were to pass this bill, I'd assume that we'd cover the same costs that we're we're doing with the baseball and the softball, right? Yeah, that would. I mean, uh, clearly that would sixteen hundred to the two thousand per year. Per right. I mean, this would this would compel you know the the, the pool bill uh, would compel a new need. So that's a you know the discussion we'd have to have with mayor's office of management and budget. There would technically be a, a cost associated. So that's that's something we need to. I mean, I work just, with them. just doing numbers in my head. I would assume around sixty thousand dollars. Right. That's about right. Okay. And, and you haven't talked to them about that yet, right? Correct. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Um, I, listen, obviously, we, we think it's important to expand to to cover all the pools. So um, this is a very important priority for us. We look forward to working with you on that. I'm going to shoot to 1042 now. Um, and, and, and this is, you know, this is a bill, and I appreciate your comment in your testimony. Um, but... We are we're trying to figure out how we give parks the discretion and authority to expand AEDs 
to others if you have them available. If in the future you decide, hey, we have extra money, we want to, we're, we're getting a lot of calls. We have teams that, that certainly can use this, other teams, lacrosse, anything, that, any teams that are playing on, on our, our city parks. So, I, and, I, and I appreciate that you're talking about we'd have to basically put in the same type of program. But I just want to be clear. We're, we're not looking to mandate you to start doing it. We're trying to give you the option so we don't have to keep coming back for legislation for new, for new teams. Because we, we, we obviously want to expand ADs to every, every team, in, in my opinion, to every team who's using a city field. So just on your thoughts on that and understanding that the intent of the bill is more of trying to, for the future, give it to you since you're running such a, a, a very good program right now and even the leagues that I talk to in my district and throughout the city, it, it's been going great. And thank God, knock on wood, that no one has had to use it. And and when, if we if and when we do, I'm 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 ecstatic that everyone's trained and everyone has them, and especially at practices and not only at the facility. So that's the intent of the bill. So just your thoughts on I, I think on we, how you can handle it and you know, where we can go from, from here. Sure. I guess, you know, so the central question, I suppose, is the notion of expansion to, to other sports and other leagues. And so I think that's a conversation that would, you know, needs to be taken seriously. And we're happy to engage with, you know, Department of Health and, and the various leagues themselves. Uh, anecdotally, I can, I can report, we, we haven't really noted or heard a, a huge clamoring for expansion from, from other non-baseball, non-softball leagues, but that doesn't mean it's not an important consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we appreciate that the bill, uh, you know, is, is flexible in its pr approach. And uh, I guess we just wanted to be clear that at least in terms of our current practices, you know, we sort of budget appropriately, right? And so we sort of purchase the devices uh, that are in place. So at this point, we don't really envision having sort of an overage or a surplus, so to speak. And uh, so I think it would take a lot of careful consideration, even if we were to end up with a surplus, you know, what would be a fair and appropriate and, and logical way to distribute that? I, th I think that's something that would take a lot of thought and consideration, but, you know, it's something I think we're open to. Right. Uh, I understood. And, and, and listen, because of, of the complexity of, of the bill, the prior bills, you understand that this isn't as easy as just putting them out, leaving them in, the, in a parks facility, and, and, you know, we're done with it. Because you have to have training. We have to you have to make sure that they're working. How is that working? Are you uh, Have you had to go check the ADs yet? Has anybody brought ADs and said they don't think they're working? Uh, so far, I don't believe there's been any incidents of a malfunctioning, but we are currently, go now that it's been two years, uh, some some of the devices have been out there for two years, so we actually just started our sort of checking in and the reapplication for the new season, so I think we'll see in the next couple months out of those conversations, you know, we're, we're keeping careful track to see if, the, you know, uh, the, the coaches and the, the leagues that, you know, keep the devices during the seasons are responsible to make sure that they're being checked daily and monthly. Um, you know, uh, battery still alive, that sort of thing. So, and, and knock on wood so far, no, no incidents thus far, but we are going through a range of uh, check-ins, if you will, uh, and, uh, and so we'll see what comes out of that. Okay. Um, so, listen, I mean, obviously we want to expand. We want to make sure everyone's safe. That's, that's the goal. Everyone who, every kid is playing sports, whether it's baseball, softball, lacrosse, soccer, we, we want them all to be safe. We want them all to have um, available ADs and, and coaches trained. And um, so that's, that's the goal. So we're just, we're trying to be creative once again to get to that goal because um, going sport by sport <laughs> is difficult. Um, there's budgetary training. Every time we do a sport, obviously another sports teams won and they deserve it just as much as the ones that we have passed already so when 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 a, when a mother father or coach comes to me and says you know we're playing lacrosse we need it too of course they need it too so we're, we're trying to find that that balance of giving you the discretion so we don't have to do legislation every every time for every sport so that's the goal um it's a priority for us. We'd like to get there. So I want to continue to have that discussion and move these two bills along so that every kid is safe and hopefully we never have to use them. But the ultimate goal here is to have the ADs there to save lives. Uh, we appreciate that, and, and, yeah, we're happy to continue. Yeah, and, and, and listen, and, and, I'll, and I'll say this, uh, my final statement on this to you is that, you know, we, we have this 
a beating hearts initiative in the council that, that I spearhead where each member gets four AEDs. We're, we're trying to expand AEDs everywhere. And, and, and discussion, and when more and more people understand these life-saving devices are available, it, it, it just it's safer for everyone, and that's where we want to go. So I appreciate your, your work with us in the past. I appreciate your comments, and I look forward to working with you to pass these bills. Thank you, Chair Grudenczyk. Thank you, Councilmember Matteo. Uh, thank you for your passion on this issue. Uh, this time, I am going to turn it over to uh, Councilmember Levine for his questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'm going to be focusing on the capital tracker, but I do want to acknowledge the incredible work that Minority Leader Matteo has done on the AED issue, saving lives, um, something I was pleased to work with him on uh, in the last term and that I'm glad he is continuing to focus on. Um, so can you tell us what, what the average time for a parks capital project is now? Uh, so I can discuss a specific, uh, so for example, we recently completed some analysis of a specific class of uh, capital project, what you might call your, your sort of typical, uh, which we consider to be a single site landscape project. And what we did was we assessed the universe of that, uh, and I think we're seeing that a range generally, uh, for, those, for, those, for that universe, between th it ranges between 30 and 45 months on average. Uh, but we have noticed a really sharp, uh, we have a sharp improvement, sharp uh, decline in the design time for uh, projects uh, completed during this new administration under the recent reforms that we've instituted. Uh, seven months saved uh, compared to projects uh, completed uh, before these uh, were uh, instituted. Right. Okay. 30 to 45 months. Now, uh, I know because we've talked about it a lot, you measure the start time at the first public scoping meeting. That's right. And uh, we, we've argued about this in other hearings, and I've explained that from the public's perspective, as soon as they hear a project is fully funded, uh, in their mind, the clock is ticking. Um, they, we, we all understand that everything's funded mostly on June 30th, and that you can't start 150 projects on July 1st. Um, and you have articulated a commitment to start all the projects within the fiscal year. And, and I think everyone understands that you need some time to stagger the starts. But I'm just explaining again, for the record, the way the public views these. Um, by the time there's a public scoping meeting, uh, in the public's mind, that's like the end of the first quarter already, right there. You know, we, we field calls for months. When's the sc scoping meeting going to be? When's the scoping meeting going to be? So. Um, I understand from your tracking purposes, that's day one, for, but for the public's purposes, that's six months, nine months, or, or God forbid, 12 months into it. Um, as for the 30 to 45 month uh, metric, uh, it's great to hear about a seven month improvement in the design stage, that, that's a big accomplishment. Uh, that's seven months out of an average of what for the design stage? So we had seen, uh, I'd say the average now uh, ranges between 9 and 12 months, give or take? I would think it's probably 12 to, oh, sorry. It's about 12 to 14 months. I'm sorry. Design. So you've cut about a third or so off of design or maybe 40%. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that's a big deal. Uh, how about the procurement stage? What's the average length and where? What are the, what's our improvement in that stage at this point? Uh, it averages about a year, give or take, and in our analysis, uh, th this is one phase, you know, because many of the reforms we've instituted uh, cannot really impact the procurement phase because so much of it is di already dictated by existing law, policy, you know, procurement policy board rules, you know, comptroller's directives, et cetera, et cetera. So there's less flexibility, if you will, in terms of internal reforms that we can make. Uh, so actually in the analysis we did, uh, we saw an increase uh, in procurement phase uh, of about a month, which, again, is sort of something that can vary widely by project. You know, if, if a project needs to be rebid it, because, you know, uh, initial con contractor bids came back, you know, uh, But why is that getting worse? We've had those problems for years. Sure. I think it's, uh, it's, it can be difficult to say. I think a lot of it is an index of the increasing uh, explosion in the, in the construction market and just the fact that, you know, bids are coming back uh, even higher, even with our uh, aggressive efforts to kind of modulate our uh, estimates in advance, you know, the pace of construction is even, you know, outpacing that. Procurement is a bureaucratic sounding word. I don't think the public even knows what it means. Sure. But 
uh, I think it's very hard for the public to understand how after design is done, the plans are all set, we know what we're going to do, we know exactly down to the location of every bench and water fountain. But before any actual work is done on the site, we're not putting any shovels in the ground, that that's 12 months. Can, can you explain in, tw in, in plain English why it takes 12 months? Sure. Um, so first and foremost, I think you're right. Like procurement is a, a, a fairly technical, jargony type word. So, but essentially, what's important for people to understand is that uh, the city agencies, generally speaking, do not actually perform construction work, you know, writ large, operating, you know, bulldozers. That that work is generally handled by private contractors, and so to retain those services, uh, the city has a a, a very regimented uh, process through which we. Uh, notify the construction community that bids are available, uh, that projects, you know, were open for bids for, for people to come and tell them, tell us about their services. Uh, they uh, submit a price, they, uh, you know, outline their qualifications, and there's a very rigorous um, uh, review process. So in terms of the various contractors, they have to meet, you know, very uh, fairly uh, aggressive, you know, ethical and background standards and checks. Uh, there's a lot of legal review with uh, the law department, comptroller's office. Um, there are various processes put in place uh, where if, you know, bids come back in a certain manner uh, that, you know, a additional review is required to make sure. And, and the goal here, and, you know, I, I can't speak to exactly why these various uh, reforms or measures were put in place, but generally speaking, the process is to ensure that, you know, where the city is allocating public funds in the, in the most appropriate manner possible, and that, you know, the, the contractors that we're acquiring are responsible and responsive, and that they're going to, you know, provide a good product. Look, ev everyone. probably every single one of the safeguards, extra process, extra transparency put in place had a great justification, and it partly emerged out of an era when there was corruption. But you add it all up, and it is, it's just leading to an unacceptable amount of time on a part of the capital process, which is neither design, which obviously takes some time, nor construction, which obviously takes some time. And, and what I'm hearing from you is that uh, even in this era of pressure, external pressure, and I think even an internal desire, mm -hmm. that, that that period is expanding, procurement is expanding in time. Is that right, you, you were gonna say? I was actually just gonna chime in. We've done a lot of analysis on the entire capital process, particularly in procurement. We looked at, it, it seems <clears throat> about 80% of the steps in procurement are outside of the parks department's hands, and this is for all agencies that do capital projects. So we have sort of a regimented process that we have to follow. First, it's legal review, um, then we have to bid out our contracts. Legal review, we have at least 30 days with the law department for bidding out our contracts, depending on what type of contract it is. It's either 22 days or 28 days that it has to be on the market. We have to do a responsibility determination. In that time frame, we have to go to DOI, we have to go to the Department of Labor Services. There's a lot of different checks along the way. Um, I think the Environmental Control Board, that can take several months to do that responsibility determination. And all those checks are sort of outside of the Parks Department and the agencies who do that review have a certain regimented time. So we, f we agree with your frustration that it does well, take a and, long time. And, and the one area where we have understood and attacked a problem with an external agency is the Public Design Commission. And my understanding is we have reduced significantly the amount of time lost at the PDC for parks projects. So tell, but tell us what else we need to do, either pushing another agency, changing the laws, what do we need to do to reduce constraints on you that are beyond your control? I, th I, th I, mean, I think there's a robust conversation that's been underway for some time now, and I think we're starting to see the fruits of that. You know, last week, uh, DDC unveiled sort of a blueprint for, you know, for some of the, and th th this is all part of sort of a citywide conversation that's happening about, uh, you know, some pilot approaches and, and reforms that can be made. I think there is further discussion to be had about potential legislative changes that can be made. Uh, I think we want to have those uh, conversations in coordination with with mayor's office of, of operations and other other key entities you know, uh, to make sure that we're having one holistic conversation. Right. So uh, th this this question of the on time percentage, which still in the MMR is being quoted at eighty eight percent, and as I explained a short while ago, uh, is not consistent with the way I think any member of the public would evaluate the on time nature of a parks project. 
right? So you're, you're, not, you're not accounting for any delays in procurement, which you identified as an area where we're having expanding delays uh, or any of the other stages. Why not just, if, if you're not going to start this, the, the game clock at the time the project's fully funded, uh, you are at least starting it at the time of design, why not measure your own time ratio based on uh, that start time? Yeah, I, you know, I think uh, I think that's a conversation you know we're open to having with Mayor's Office of Operations. I can't speak to how the metrics were developed and and, and what the rationale was at the time. I, I did mention earlier. I think in, there is some to some degree, you know, an average citizen, you know, a, a project's construction period is probably the most visible. You know, it's the, it's the period during time they might actually not be able to get into the park, for example. So I think there is value in sort of in terms of construction being the primary phase that's the most, shall we say, you know, impactful or potentially disruptive. Um, and so as, as a metric, I think that's, you know, uh, that makes a lot of sense. But I think we're open to, to other discussions as well. Uh, understood. And so, uh, on, on, and I'll, I'll try and wrap up, Mr. Chair, but on the, on the, the question of the parks tracker itself, um, there, there's so much more information that could be there that I think would be useful to the public. Um, so w why not list, for example, the names of the contractors? Uh, you know, that's an interesting uh, element. It's actually not included in the bill, uh, so that's something I, I don't know that we've uh, taken a look at. So I think we'd have to, you know, I, I don't there may be legal implications. That's something I think we'd have to take a look at. But, but as soon as the city signs a contract with somebody, that's public information, no? I'd have to double check. I'm not. I'm not as familiar with you know freedom of information law and that sort of thing. So I'd, I'd have to double check if that's the case. But it, it may be, and that's that's something I think we can look into. I understand that because we have talked prior that um, sometimes the explanation for a delay is not clear cut, but sometimes it is. Sometimes it's because uh, you got no bids in and you have to restart the process. Uh, sometimes it's because there was a change in scope of the project. Sometimes it's because there was unexpected um, site conditions. Uh, and I'm sure you have very discreet record keeping on that in your internal databases. So in, when, when, when you have a very clear cause of a delay, why not tell the public that? Well, a couple different things. The tracker does provide some narrative characterization of where the project currently is. So if it's in procurement and it's you know uh, being reviewed by by law department and other entities, that is actually characterized. You know, I don't think that's necessarily the instance of a delay uh, per se, but that's just sort of as a as a broader perspective. And and the and we do on the tracker uh, if there is a timeline change, we do provide a range of uh, instances or circumstances that can lead to, you know, uh, Changes but that's just generic industry. general language. Yeah, for, for, for general awareness. I, I think we'd be concerned about a rubric or a scheme in which certain projects would benefit from clear-cut explanations, whereas others couldn't. And I think uh, for legal and other operational reasons, uh, you know, the current, it's not as if the current database has, you know, a, a, a pithy, you know, two or three word explanation. Uh, the reasons that can sometimes lead to changes in those timelines can be very, very complex. Um, and so I think it doesn't really easily lend itself to sort of succinct uh, summarization. Ha having lived through many capital projects in my district, I know that the question of whether and when a project is fully funded is something that, that you all are understandably extremely focused on. And all of us as council members are used to hearing, um, sorry, we can't start work because it's not fully funded. Um, or we might hear that, well, it was fully funded, but the project scope changed or cost inflated. It's no longer fully funded. I know that you are keenly aware of this question of funding, as, as you have to be. So I'm sure that you are recording the moment at which a project is fully funded. I, I'm sure it's in one of your databases. So what, what would be wrong with letting the public know that date? Uh, you're correct. It is. It is. You know, whether a project's fully funded is is a is a is a matter that we are very keenly aware of. It is something that we do track internally, not in the same manner that we track the data that to, that is tied to the to the capital project tracker. Um, but I think, uh, on a broader sense, I think we really feel strongly that in terms of the the public's real interaction. Although we, I fully acknowledge that there are often you know advocates for a specific park who are keenly advocating for a project, and they, and you know and they may be you know very aware of when a project is. Uh, been funded or partially funded, or as that happens over time, 
Uh, but I think in terms of our approach to making sure you know the entire community knows about a project and opening the doors for a public scoping session, making sure everybody, as many people are at that table as possible so that we can hear what they really want out of the project, that to us feels like the most inclusive, most logical point at which the general public at large is aware of the project and you know our teams and or the design consultant is putting pen to paper like that to us is the touch point at which a project truly starts uh, i think there are other internal you know uh, machinations that do happen in terms of funding and or you know uh, determining whether a project's fully funded something kind of as you as you referred to it can be deemed fully funded and then circumstances can change turns out public sentiment actually wanted something else so the scope changes or you know an unforeseen site conditions you know a variety uh, you know the bid the bid process things can kind of fall in and out of that that so I think we're concerned about a rubric uh, tied to reporting that in which you know things can be so fluid and I think that you know could easily just lead to greater confusion okay well the chair has been very generous in, in allowing me time on this and so I'm gonna pass it back I just want to close by stating emphatically that transparency is good for accountability and it's good for the public it's key to us ultimately solving this um, unacceptable situation and we need to push the envelope on getting as much information in a clear and transparent way to the public as possible um, and it's, it's, it's the basis for this legislation and uh, something we're, we're going to continue to push on and I thank you and pass it back to the chair. Thank you uh, Councilman Levine, thank you for your efforts. I do want to add my voice to his. Um, I think that uh, just about every single member of this council and I would dare say many members of the Parks Department are frustrated, uh, people that work for Parks, um, in our inability to move projects along uh, more quickly. I do want to commend Commissioner Silver for his efforts there. And I'm hopeful that soon we will hold a hearing on procurement citywide. Uh, the city spends um, billions, over $10 billion a year on capital construction. And certainly we could be doing better on that um, And by, by uh, streamlining the process, we would uh, certainly be saving uh, taxpayers hundreds of millions, if not a billion dollars or more a year. And I do agree also with Councilman Levine that the construction phase is critical. I was recently on the phone for about 20 minutes with a constituent. Um, they put up a fence at Belrose Playground, uh, which is actually being uh, overseen by School Construction Authority. Uh, and so the kids were no longer able to use it, uh, although there was no no work going on for at least a couple of weeks and I explained to the constituent that once the contractor has control that he or she is responsible and they have to ensure that nobody gets hurt there so um, that's what people see though they don't really see everything else everything else is procurement what kind of word could we use Councilman Levine maybe maybe we could put Amazon in charge of the procurement it would happen faster I don't know there's another can of worms okay um, at this time I I do want to ask you, I have one other question for you, and if I could find it, I will ask it. Um, I assume there's a formal process on the AEDs that with the training, if, if one is needed, um, they know exactly what they're doing. That's right. Um, there is, a, it actually, it's folded into our field permit process, so when a league approaches us, uh, there's a very clear sort of uh, uh, process whereby they, you know, they, it's compulsory that before they can receive their field permits, uh, they must, you know, receive the devices, attest that they have them, and then provide uh, adults uh, an adequate number of adults to be trained in the in the uh, deployment of those devices. So yeah, there's a fairly rigid uh, uh, process that's set in place that's working fairly well. Okay. All right. Um, at this time, I don't have any more questions. I don't think my colleagues do. I want to welcome Councilman Moya, uh, my colleague also from Queens. And I want to thank you for your testimony this morning. I would ask, of course, as you always do, to uh, listen to some of the other people that are testifying here today. And with that, uh, I'm going to call up the next panel. Um, the next panel is Robin Vitale, uh, Melinda Murray, and Steve Tannenbaum, all with the, uh, well, two of them are with the uh, American Heart Association. We welcome Ms. Murray from East Elmhurst.
Thank you. Ms. Vitale, if you'd like to begin, or, okay. <laughs> Ms. Murray, when you're ready. Press the button. Okay. Yes. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity on today to share my son Dominic's story and address the Council and Parks Committee on the importance of life-saving AEDs in public settings, especially where youth congregate. <coughs> my son Dominic suffered sudden cardiac, arrest, sudden cardiac death during a pickup basketball game. When his heart abruptly stopped, Dominic did not have access immediately to an AED. Those who were there didn't know where to find it or how to use it. I'm here to speak up for Dominic and the many young hearts silenced by sudden cardiac arrest. His tragedy, my reality, is another example of how we should try to protect victims when they're playing organized sports or unorganized sports. In the last nine years since Dominic's sudden death, thousands upon thousands of children have died and many of them could have been saved. AEDs in public places make a difference between lives saved and lives lost. As a mother who lost her only child, I believe that no child should be at risk playing sports due to lack of life-saving equipment. Don't our children deserve to be protected? On October 5th, it will be 10 years that Dominic has been gone, but it feels more like 10 seconds ago. There has to come a day when there are no more children dying playing in parks, schools, or anywhere. Accessible AEDs in parks is a positive start. That is my testimony and my appeal to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Murray, and uh, I'm very sorry for what you suffered through. Um, someone who grew up playing sports uh, all over the borough of Queens. Um, it certainly hits home to me, and I know to all the members of this panel. So thank you for being here with us today and uh, sharing your personal story. Mr. Chairman, uh, council members, uh, good morning. My name is Stephen Tannenbaum. I was born and educated in Brooklyn, New York, and I attended New York Law School just a few blocks away from here. I am here to testify as a living example as to why AED should be made readily available and accessible to all New Yorkers by placing them at pools, athletic fields, all other possible locations, and accessible at all hours of the day. Uh, in three weeks, I will turn 66 years old, but my real birthday is actually May 6, 2009, so I'm just about to be 10 years old. <laughs> On that day in May, uh, just about 10 years ago, I died from a sudden cardiac arrest on a softball field while playing at a park in Oceanside, New York. Statistically, about 1,000 other Americans suffered from a cardiac arrest that same day, and only about 6 or 7 percent survived to tell their story, as I'm telling mine now. Sadly, there was no AED readily available on that softball field because there was no law requiring its presence. My life would have ended that day at that time, but I had the good fortune to have a police car in the immediate vicinity of where I suffered my cardiac arrest. Once the 911 call went out following my arrest, a police car responded which contained an AED, and I was shocked three times by an automated external defibrillator within three minutes. That is the only reason I am alive today and why I am here to experience this with you and with my lovely wife, who is the beneficiary, I think, uh, of all this good fortune. <laughs> At least I think it is. <laughs> in instead of referring to May 6, 2009 as the day I died, I can now refer to it as my rebirth day. I'm here today in the hope that thousands of other New Yorkers will have a second chance at life that I have had. It is critical that we have AEDs together with cardiac emergency response plans immediately available to as many New Yorkers as possible, particularly those engaged in athletic activities. As good as our ambulance and police crews are, with the congestion in New York City, sudden cardiac arrest victims do not have the luxury of waiting for a first responder to arrive with an AED. 
CPR and AED usage by the lay population have proven to be critical in saving the lives of sudden cardiac arrest victims. My goal here is to create many more happy rebirthdays and to end preventable loss of life from sudden cardiac arrest. Today we have an opportunity to continue to make New York City the safest big city in America, and I urge you to take this critical step to support this mission. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Tannenbaum, for sharing your story. It's great, it's great to hear that the efforts that we do uh, bear fruit, so thank you. Uh, before Ms. Vitale testifies, we've been joined by uh, Councilman Mark Joni and Councilman Andy Cohn, both of the Bronx, and uh, Ms. Vitale, Vice President of Health Strategies of the American Heart Association in New York City. Thank you, sir, and thank you, Chair, and the members of the committee for this opportunity. Um, I think you see now why I defer to Melinda and Steve to, uh, to lead this panel. Their stories, I think, really help to demonstrate exactly what it is that uh, the council and this committee should be striving to achieve, and that is to make sure that AEDs are readily available um, in as many locations as possible, and ideally as often and uh, without any kind of restrictions to the public as possible. And we certainly do support the, the two uh, proposals on the agenda today um, as part of that strategy. Uh, my testimony provides a little bit more technical information rel relative to cardiac arrest and heart disease in a broader sense. Um, but I do want to just draw your attention to two specific areas. Um, one, noting that the Heart Association and uh, along with many of our other partners in this space, have been working diligently over the last several years to broaden community-based training. Um, this training does not result in certification. It's just a very simple hands-only CPR initiative. Um, I have joined both Steve and Melinda on many occasions doing that type of community outreach. Our goal is to make sure that more and more New Yorkers are aware of what to do when someone collapses from cardiac arrest. Um, they know to initiate CPR, call 911, and go get an AED. That is the last piece that I want to make sure you're all aware of, is that as we are training more New Yorkers to be aware of an AED, they need to know that there's an AED available to them. And so the more we're talking about uh, locking them away, keeping them um, uh, you know, invisible, so to speak, from the public, we run into an, a concern that we won't be able to, to get the AED and we might be wasting valuable minutes um, in that search to find it. So as you're thinking about these initiatives and thinking about how we can make them more accessible, we encourage you to um, think creatively and, and really um, do your due diligence to make sure that those AEDs are readily available to everyone at all times. Um, connected to that, we know that there's um, ongoing initiatives around CPR training. Again, we are uh, newly um, addressing this in high school curriculum. So every high school student that graduates from uh, the high school in the city and really across the state is now trained in CPR and AED use. So we're creating a, a literal army of uh, responders to cardiac arrest victims. But again, we need to make sure that they are ready um, to respond with that AED as quickly as possible. Um, so again, I encourage you to read my testimony in its entirety, but uh, applaud the council for this intention and we look forward to working with you to really develop a comprehensive strategy regarding AED access. I thank you for being here today. Thank you for your work. Um, it's critical. Um, you know, uh, it, we, we all know people, we've all lost people to um, heart disease and sudden heart attacks and, um, you know, I've witnessed it with my own eyes as a young person uh, several times and, you know, it, both those people didn't make it, so it was kind of very tragic. Um, at this time, I know that um, Councilman Moyer, followed by Councilman Matteo, would like to uh, comment on, on your testimony. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, it's just more of a comment because I just want to really take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, Melinda uh, for all the great work that you've done, uh, even going back to the days in Albany. Uh, and, and going up there to champion this issue, um, you have taken a tragedy and turned this into a great educational tool uh, for a lot of elected officials uh, who are not familiar with what is going on. Um, I know that once we met, there was a great connection on uh, what we need to do and what I need to do, and I have to also uh, take this opportunity to uh, uh, applaud um, Councilmember Matteo for his great work and advocacy 
um, in introducing uh, some much needed legislation uh, and being a real advocate in the budget process uh, to making sure that we have the right equipment uh, going out there. Um, but I just wanted to thank you for the wonderful work that you do uh, time and time again, not just for uh, the people of uh, East Elmhurst and Corona, but uh, for all of the people here in the city of New York. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Min uh, thank you Councilman Moya. Um, Mr. Manio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Melinda, you know, as Councilmember Moya said, you turn tragedy into advocacy, and that certainly is, is not easy. Uh, I was a parent of four children. I, I can't imagine the pain that you went through um, as a coach to two of them. You see firsthand why we need ADs regardless of the sport that we're playing. Um, and it's to the credit of the Parks Department that, to Robin's point, that we did get creative in the last bill because we did in our last hearing last year in the, on, the, on the two bills that um, I sponsored in this council passed that we didn't want AEDs to be locked away and just to say that they're there because that's not the point. The point was to have them at practices, at games, in the coaches' hands, and training. So um, this council and the administration, the Parks Department specifically, I think they have worked with us to to pass legislation that I don't think we would have passed unless we got creative. So that's with your advocacy, we appreciate that. It's with your story and your heartfelt. Uh, you know, I, I'm I I feel when I feel your pain when you when you talk about it, and I and I admire your, your advocacy to to turn it into strength. Um, Steve, happy rebirth day. Thank you. Then, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's great that you come here and, and you can share that and share a moment with your, your wonderful wife. And, and we understand that this is why we're doing this. This is why we're doing this. And this is why, you know, this council, um, the agencies, that we're working together to make sure that we expand this. Because you're right. We, when we did baseball, we wanted to do softball. When we did softball, we wanted to do other sports. We want everyone covered. And as you can see, the intricacies, it's not always as easy as just putting them there because they have to be trained, right? And listen, through my Beating Hearts initiative, I was personally trained. I have an AD in my office um, and in my car because of the Beating Hearts initiative that I sponsor in the budget. And I, 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 I um, employ all, implore all my colleagues to, to be trained as well um, but like I said, everybody needs to be trained. Everybody needs to know how to operate an AD. And when you actually get trained, you could realize how simple it is to save a life. As the, the technology and it is now, it, it walks you through it, and you can save a life. And to hear your story is just, uh, we're thankful you're here. And we, we wish you the best in, in, in living a long and healthy and prosperous life. So thank you. Uh, you have our commitment that we will keep pushing to expand, because that's the goal. The goal is to save lives. And um, sometimes government does not help in, in certain instances, and that's just, that's just the truth. I think here we all want to help. We all want to make sure that we get this right. We all want to make sure we expand. So you have my commitment that I will keep working to expand, uh, to work with my colleagues and the speaker and, and the administration pass these two bills and to move forward to make everyone safe. So thank you, Rob, thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for showing up at every hearing and providing your, your technical expertise. It's always helpful. You know, a lot of, a lot of the negotiations happen, you know, be now behind the scenes, and we're, we're, all, we're gonna sit, we're gonna talk, and staff's gonna talk, and we're, we're gonna make sure. So everything that you bring to the table is helpful for us. We thank you for that, and um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, council members. Um, I want to thank the panel again for bringing such personal testimony. Um, it's very, very important. And I often tell people that come to my district office to complain about something. Um, you know, one person can change the world. It does happen. Uh, believe me, I've seen it many, many times. And so we're happy you're here today. And, and as uh, council member Matteo has so eloquently stated today, it does take longer sometimes to do things than we want. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not worth doing, and uh, every life is valuable, every single life. We know that. So I want to thank you for being here with us, and I'm going to dismiss this panel.
uh, but we have another one right behind it, uh, Ismael Galvez, David Hiltz, and Andrew Zelter, who are also going to testify on this bill. And then Dan Huber, we haven't forgotten about. Where's Dan? Okay. You're next. You get to close. Thank you. No, it's a different topic. Yeah. Whoever would like to start, I guess we could start with Mr. Galvez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Council. Um, my background is in EMS. Uh, I used to work as a medic many years ago, and I also work in trauma. And um, I have seen firsthand um, what it does take and, and the lives that it has taken as well. Um, you know, and, and I'm just here to provide just proof of those uh, experiences that I've had. Um, one instance, um, I was asked to train a group of people um, here in the city, actually, where a um, a gentleman went, uh, went unconscious in one of the bathrooms. He actually suffered a heart attack. And um, he went unconscious. Uh, so happens that a, uh, an intern happened to be a lifeguard. And uh, he began doing compressions. Now, a heart attack for many people think it uh, has no correlation with cardiac arrest, but it actually does. Um, it puts so much stress in this man's heart that it caused a cardiac arrest. So his heart, not only did he suffer a, a heart attack, but on top of that, it was a cardiac arrest. Now, uh, as you may know, a cardiac arrest, a person only has about 10 minutes of life left before they go into asystole, which is there's no electrical activity. And at that point, uh, you cannot depolarize the heart anymore. Um, so what happened was that um, he was able to request for an AD. An AD came in, um, it was placed on the man, it analyzed the rhythm and it determined to be shocked. This uh, defibrillator was an automatic defibrillator, so it was not even a need for him to push a button. The machine automatically detected the rhythm, uh, it said to stay clear, and the machine automatically delivered that shock without the person ever needing to even push a button, you know? Um, so machines have changed a lot over the past years. They've become a lot smaller, more compact as well, um, and even more affordable, I think, uh, over the years. So um, later on, uh, I met the man, um, met his whole, you know, um, employees. He ha actually happened to be a partner at a financial institution here in New York, um, you know, and um, I've been teaching many places, schools, parks, you know, churches, daycares, and people tell me, you know, just knowing this gives them, empowers them to be able to do something if we just had it out there, you know. So I, I want New York to be a model city, um, not only for the U.S., but for the world, that we can have this out there. Uh, so many people are dying every day of cardiac arrest. A person a minute dies of cardiac arrest, you know. Um, so I thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Galvez, for your testimony. Thank you very much. Mr. Hiltz. Is this working? If you see the little button that lights up a little. Thank you, Pat. Try now? All right. Perfect. There we go. I apologize. No worries. Uh, so, um, uh, interesting uh, listening to uh, the comments uh, from the, the council and uh, your staff from Parks and Recreation. Uh, I am a uh, career uh, emergency care advocate and consultant, um, and I've received exposure from not only work domestically here in the United States, uh, but ab abroad as well. I've listened carefully to uh, the challenges that are in front of you uh, regarding uh, reliable access to timely defibrillation uh, in public spaces. And um, despite the widespread and uh, proliferation of AEDs, uh, ironically, despite that, they are still not often available, uh, particularly after business hours, uh, weekends, holidays, when people are still enjoying our open public spaces. Um, what I'd like to do is share with you my own personal story in looking to solve this. Uh, and yes, perhaps I'm biased. I have a lacrosse shirt on today. Uh, so we want uh, to be certain that uh, our, our youth, our coaches, their parents, and spectators all have reliable access to life-saving equipment, whether that be AEDs, uh, nasal Narcan, bleeding control, et cetera. 
Uh, so I became involved in a uh, youth lacrosse organization, startup in Rhode Island, where I currently live. I hail from Long Island, so I brought my love for lacrosse uh, with me to Rhode Island. And here I had 12 youth lacrosse teams using a semi-rural open space for practice and games. It's also used by cross-country runners and others. And I'm, of course, very aware of the need for access to defibrillators. So how am I going to do this? And yes, I did think of providing a defibrillator to each coach. However, when I looked at the financials on that, that's not going to happen. So can I hide a defibrillator in a tree? I mean, really, I had to think this through. And interestingly enough, I became aware of uh, what they were doing in the UK where they were taking decommissioned red phone boxes, the old phone booths, and converting them into uh, uh, tourist information kiosks and life-saving defibrillator kiosks. And so, long story short, I imported that strategy from the UK to my own community of Westerly, and now, in all of our parks and high school fields, you will find these yellow uh, secure access and heated enclosures. So what I'm trying to say here is more is not always better. Better is better. And I think if we are creative as a group, and I'm happy to lend my expertise and experience, if we are creative, we can make better use of what we already have and also serve not only the softball and baseball communities, but the entire community of New York that enjoys the open spaces in our parks and other facilities. Mr. Mr. Hiltz, are these kiosks locked? Yeah, that's the question. When New York so, here, we're, so, you know. So interesting, and and uh, you know, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing. Yeah, we didn't sway right? in, so. We, but uh, I, I so <laughs> so um, I opted for secure access in Westerly. So there's a mechanical punch code that gets put in. A witness bystander to an emergency calls 911. That information is integrated into their CAD system, their computer aided dispatch system. Call comes up, the location, they provide the code to access the life saving equipment. That is the standard throughout the UK, uh, with the exception of London. London has decided to use the same enclosures with the heating element and so forth, but they prefer to have them unlocked, and they accept the they're losing one or two defibrillators a month. Um, but you know, thus far, uh, you know, I'm always looking at how can we remove or limit points of potential failure. And the whole notion of empowering the coaches is great, but when I started thinking about the maintenance of those and are they rescue ready, because you're relying on all those people, that, in my personal opinion, is an increased exposure to risk, whereby, you know, rather than, you know, several hundred AEDs to cover 100 parks, you get 100 AEDs to cover 100 parks, and we know where they are, and they're very easy to check. Um, you know, it takes about less than 60 seconds to check uh, a device in an enclosure uh, because on the viewing window on the cabinet, you place a label that indicates the expiry date uh, for the battery and or pads. You can easily visualize the status indicator light and uh, whether there's power to the unit. Uh, this information is logged. It's kept, again, keeps the devices rescue ready. I appreciate the question. It was an excellent one. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Zelter. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, committee chair and council members, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Andrew Zelter. Uh, I'm here representing Downtown Little League. We are in our 27th year of providing organized baseball and softball to children ranging in ages from 5 to 17. Uh, we also are very proud to operate a challengers program for children with special needs that give kids the opportunity to come out and enjoy 
uh, the athletic experience, and I would invite you to come witness this. It's perhaps one of the most heartwarming experiences you'll see on a field. Uh, I'm here today. We are a participant in the AED program, and I'd first like to begin by acknowledging the tremendous effort of the Parks Department. So, Mr. Drury, if you'd take that back on behalf of our community, I think your staff has done truly a remarkable job with an administrative task that just seems overwhelming. Uh, our program, just to give you some parameters, we are approximately 1,100 children, which according to Little League International, makes us the largest single chapter program in the United States. Interesting that that's in Lower Manhattan. Our constituency is Lower Manhattan, which is defined as south of Canal Street. You got a lot of density, though. We do. <laughs> Uh, and not enough fields, but that's a different subject. That was the last hearing. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, we have a busy weekend upcoming and that through the parks uh, and recreation support, we are training a number of our coaches. Personally, I am also uh, renting a van to bring up the AEDs to be inspected and, and checked. Uh, so again, I think it's a fantastic process and, and I think it's certainly a, a cause that deserves all of our time and attention. Having lived with this program for two years and perhaps focusing a bit on the comments from the gentleman to my right, uh, I, I think there is an opportunity to take a step back two years into the program and assess if there are ways to tweak it perhaps moving forward. And I don't know what's feasible and what's not feasible, but I can tell you that we as a program, we're in the midst of our permitting process now. Uh, I don't know if there's a possibility to give organizations seeking permits an option to either arrange to comply with this through their own channels or resources, or to have, a, have the service made available, meaning someone from parks or maybe a partnership with the American Heart Association that there's a representative there with a device that is trained and the trade-off being that if I check that box that I want the support provided, I understand it comes at a financial cost to the organization. And I'm not advocating that this become a pay for play as it relates to permits, not at all. The permitting process is what it is. But I understand as an organization, I have an obligation to, to ensure that we're compliant with the AED codes and, and regulations governing use of that park and to the comment that was made more is not always necessarily better is there a way to consider how to enhance compliance and ensure that to the questions that I, I think have been asked how are we tracking that this is working as we need it to work and in short having someone from a park staff or again if it can be done the city in partnership with an outside organization, we would certainly be willing to take a look at as a means of making it more effective for our own organization, understanding there may be a cost to, to sign up for that service. So I throw that out there. I thank you for your testimony, you all. Uh, Mr. Matteo, uh, Councilman Matteo has a comment. Thank you all for your, for your testimony. I appreciate you being here. Um, and listen, when um, we had the hearing, the first hearing a few years ago, and all these issues came up, and sir, your your issue was a crux. What we were talking about for for hours about how do we get them? How, you know, can we leave them in Central Park all over the place? Can we leave them in Clove Lakes Park in my district all over the place? Theft was 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 the big issue. If we're going to buy all these ads, certainly theft. We we can't have them locked. Um, but so I just want to just clarify what you were saying about because it's an interesting how you're doing it. So it's a code that is given to you once someone dials 911 and you give a location. So like my point, I'm just trying to, I heard what you, I think I heard that the access is given to you so anyone can call and Correct. get, and get right. the code, right? Correct. So I'm passing by, I see someone who needs an AD, I see the booth, I call 911, I tell them where we are and they give me the access code? Right, and in fact, it may not even be that you see the bright yellow box, but when you give the, uh, the dispatcher, the emergency telecommunicator, your location, he's going to bring that location up on his or her uh, CAD screen. And if you're within proximity 
of a 24-7 accessible device. They will say, you know, look to the right of the building. Can you see a yellow cabinet? Is there somebody there who can go get it? And, and they are provided with alphanumeric code um, to access the device. And again, now, given the environment and the world that we live in, uh, you know, it's also a recommendation that you consider, you know, placing naloxone, epinephrine, and bleeding control equipment right. in there as well. as well. Has it uh, ever been used? Uh, and the, so we've only got about a dozen of these in North America. However, in the UK, they are used extensively. People are not in the practice of placing defibrillators inside buildings unless it's, you know, a multi-floor type of setting. Uh, they're Rather, they're putting them outside to make them 24-7 accessible. There's, there's little justification uh, for not having a 24-7 available defibrillator. To that end, there is new and emerging technology that will provide multiple checks throughout the day of a fixed location AED and will notify the owner um, of any issue uh, via SMS, text message, email, et cetera, et cetera, within, you know, I mean, it takes a photo and does a status check like every two hours. So you start rolling that in and you start putting all this stuff together and you've got a much more robust system with fewer points of failure that ironically becomes more affordable. Fair enough. I appreciate the information. We'll look into these things. My absolute pleasure. Very, very helpful. Coach, let me just ask you something. Uh, yeah. I'm, um, so uh, just to be clear what you're asking, you're just looking that maybe an option for, for leagues to, to get the training on their own is? No, what I was referring to, so when, when we file for our permits, we understand that we have an obligation to provide right. a trained adult with an AED device. Okay. We're a very large program. We have quite a few coaches. It's also an administrative task on us, which we understand we have to do. Okay. I was inquiring if there's an option when we submit our permit to ask that a trained resource with an AED be provided okay. during the times that we have permits. And I would understand or would expect that there would be a cost associated to us if we asked for that service to be outsourced. Okay. I just wanted to be clear. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Matteo. I believe uh, Councilmember Joe and I has a question. Thank you, Chairman. Um, what is the cost factor of this very common sense and intriguing notion of using something that's already available without uh, having to reinvent the wheel? Yeah, given the purchasing power of the city, uh, I would say it would be pretty safe to assume that you could get these enclosures, uh, the, you know, the deluxe, two millimeter stainless steel, IP rating of 66, 10,000 hour salt tested because you are near the ocean for less than $1,000 a piece. And the 10 year warranty. The particular uh, devices that you're referring to, do they also allow for Narcan to be stored there as well? Yes, there is so ample there is ample real estate inside these particular enclosures that would easily accommodate epinephrine auto injectors nasal Narcan, and bleeding control equipment. The, so in your particular town, they have Narcan as well as AEDs. Our intent is to add nasal Narcan, epinephrine auto injectors, and bleeding control. Right now, that is a cost concern, um, but I see it uh, being a reality in the near future, and I do know of certain local initiatives in Rhode Island who have written for grants where that is their intent. So it's only a matter of time. I want to ask you a question on the model that you described uh, that is self-powering, no button, no training really required except for placing a machine on a chest. That is correct. Uh, yes, that is what correct. What is the cost of that particular defibrillator? Um, they're around a thousand dollars around there, and they are going even less. 
Um, there's machines um, that I've already uh, seen that are out there, which are very small, um, probably bigger, a little bit bigger than the size of a cell phone. And technology has changed so much. I, I tell you, because I've used these out there. And these machines, you just put them on, it analyzes the rhythm, determines if it needs to shock, <laughs> and the machine does it automatically. Everybody stay clear. Once they hear that voice, people stay clear out of it, you know? And the machine delivers the right amount that it needs for that particular person, you know? Um, so the technology is already there. Also, within regards to- Where do we to, find yeah. these particular units? They are, yeah. they're, they're being sold in the US and uh, across Europe as well. You know, there these units are Our out EMS, there. Uh, or yeah, emergency EMS. Yeah, EMS. Response. Uh, yes, they has have that particular unit. They have them. Um, some EMS, depending on what EMS uh, department it is. Um, but there are current models out there right now that actually have that. There are also, we was talking about the IP ingress protection, which is um, how much water and dust it can take. Also has been military tested. And they're very small units. Um, also, the uh, the checking of the, uh, the units, most of them are every two years. Well, nowadays, every four years, the pads and the batteries could be changed. So not only do you have, there's an extra expense, which was before, every two years somebody had to, again, buy these batteries and then buy these pads. It is no longer the case, you know? Um, so they're more compact. They're a lot easier to use as well, you know? I want to thank you for yeah, this of course. Uh, common sense yeah. approach. And uh, let me tell you, I mean, using them, I want something that's simple and easy for people to right. use and not have such a big issue. Having these huge machines that are out there, I've used an EMS. I worked since the 90s. Um, and I tell you, when I started, there were these um, humongous machines out there. Nowadays, they're so tiny and small, you know? You know, we, we don't yeah. realize this, but in the event of a heart attack, uh, the emotions uh, and the hysteria that's going through the person's mind, even if they're trained that very moment, uh, they may not remember their complete yeah. training. So this particular unit uh, mm -hmm. would take the guessing out of it. And, uh, Absolutely. And then what I've seen people say, well, well, I'm afraid. What if I if I need to shock them? I don't want to shock them by mistake. Yeah. And this is what people always, um, people always have told me, you know, especially survivors of this. What could happen, you know? I want to take these classes now because my husband, you know, had a cardiac arrest and I didn't know what to do. Chairman, yeah. it sounds like we're going to be working on a new bill that requires uh, our 911 call boxes to uh, be converted, especially in our parks. And I'm looking forward to working on that with you and uh, Chair Matteo as we uh, include Narcan and um, Stop the Bleeding uh, kits, first aid. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your enthusiasm for this legislation. I want to thank the panel for giving us uh, such uh, vivid testimony this morning. Um, Mr. Huber, IBO. Get the bill. I'll there give it go. to you. I'll let you guys fight it out. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman and members of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. Uh, I am Daniel Huber, the Environmental Analyst at the New York City Independent Budget Office. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding Intro 161. Uh, the intro would expand the information the Department of Parks and Recreation is required to report on its online project tracker, a useful tool that already provides detail on each project's location, phase, funding level, and timeline. New data uh, required by Intro 161 would include information on the reasons for capital project delays and the cause and extent of cost overruns. <coughs> IBO's role is to provide nonpartisan information on the city's budget to members of the council, other elected officials, and the public. Although we generally do not make recommendations, we are in favor of increasing government transparency, especially when it comes to budgeting and for disclosing information, additional information of the sort required in Intro 161. As IBO's environmental analyst, I often receive questions about Parks Department capital projects. Uh, these questions range from the status of a local project to broader questions about the city's capital budgeting process. While we can provide information on changes in the overall budget and shifts in, in funding for specific projects, we often run into roadblocks in trying to track and identify the cause of project delays and cost overruns, which is often what the requesters would want to know most. 
Um, identifying the cause of the delay or a cost overrun for a specific project is difficult given the nature of New York City's capital commitment plan, uh, the city's capital planning document. In terms of delays, the capital commitment plan provides little detail on the planned time frame of a capital project. In fact, the Parks Department capital tracker already provides more information than is available in city budget documents because it contains a project timeline with estimated start and completion dates. Uh, the commitment plan does contain a milestone field uh, to indicate the project's current status along with projected start and end dates. Unfortunately, these fields are generally left blank. Uh, moreover, even when status is included, it is rarely updated between plans. Uh, recognizing a cost overrun in city budget documents is similarly difficult. Uh, the capital commitment plan is divided by budget line and then by project. Uh, a project may either be for discrete work, uh, for example, Orchard Beach Pavilion, or it may be for a bundle of similar projects, uh, for example, park security measures citywide. Uh, while the commitment plan provides the total funding plan for a project, uh, there is little detail on, on funding for the project's individual components. Moreover, moreover it is often unclear uh, if the funding levels represent the total estimated cost of the project. Uh, if funding is increased in subsequent plans, it can be difficult to discern whether this new funding level represents an increase in cost, an overrun, a change of scope, or if the additional funds were part of the initial cost estimate but are just newly reflected in city budget documents. Uh, it's important to note that the difficulty in identifying delays and cost overruns is not limited to the Parks Department. It is something we encounter with capital projects citywide. Uh, the Parks Department is actually already more transparent about its capital projects than other city agencies uh, because of its online capital projects tracker. The tracker is a valuable resource that we use routinely and we often assist members of the public in using it as well. In summary, uh, Parks capital projects are an area of intense public interest and in adding information to the capital projects tracker particularly on the extent of and reasons for delays and cost overruns would help shed light on an already opaque process. Uh, given IBO's support for increased transparency and data sharing in general, perhaps the enhanced capital project tracker could be an example for other agencies on how to communicate progress and provide detailed information on their capital projects. Thank you. I thank you, uh, Mr. Huber, and I thank uh, your agency. I'm uh, not a frequent customer, but I am a customer, and I always appreciate the information I get from the IBO. I would appreciate it if you could uh, give my uh, regards to Ms. Lowenstein, your director. Um, I don't know if any of my colleagues have any questions. I don't think so. So I want to thank you for that, um, for your support this morning. And um, seeing no one else ready to testify, I am going to close this hearing. At 1140, I thank you all for being here today, and we will see you later this month for our next hearing on statues, or the lack of uh, statues for uh, representing females. So uh, with that, we are done. <laughs>